Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright, a consultant audiologist and director of ClearX. Thank you for joining me in my latest video where I used the right angle correct, which you saw at the beginning of the, of the, of the video, to safely remove earwax in a patient who suffers from severe debilitating tinnitus. And so I'll give you the patient's um, case history. Um, they first started suffering from tinnitus several years ago after undergoing ear irrigation. And since then, uh, obviously, they're not able to have their earwax removed using irrigation. So if you, if you have tinnitus, it is and severe tinnitus like that, it is a contraindication to perform irrigation. And in addition, you want to avoid microsuction wherever possible. This patient has undergone microsuction previously elsewhere, and they just found that it spiked their tinnitus. Um, it was short-lived, it lasted several days, but they just prefer to have the earwax removed manually where there's no noise which may exacerbate or aggravate their existing tinnitus. Um, so they travel from afar to, uh, to have their earwax removed on a regular basis, I would say every six to eight months. So it's quite a, a quick build-up as you can see. And they've got a narrow entrance of the ear and it's quite a bendy ear canal as well. Um, what makes this procedure a bit tricky is the consistency of the wax. Ideally you would prefer the wax to be a bit firmer. Um, if it's firmer you can use the correct and hopefully remove it in a, a large plug uh, or even an ear hook or forceps but this wax is quite wet and loose. I would say it's like a type 6 consistency of wax. Um, so uh, if you're not aware, a few a couple of years ago, uh, I, th I just thought about modifying the Bristol stool chart um, into a ceremony chart to better segregate and to, um, categorize the consistency of earwax because there is quite a variation. And so there's t seven types, type one being the, the, the most solid, hardened type of wax um, resembling hard stool and type 7 earwax consistency um, being very wet, runny, almost like um, your type 7 stool, so like diarrhea. Um, and it is useful, so I use this categorization now in my clinical notes. So when a patient attends again, I review their notes and it gives me an idea of the consistency of wax and how I'm best going to approach it. And another difficulty with this is that some of the wax, as you can see, it's quite deep. Um, so we're having to go in quite far with the correct. Now, this is where the new right angle correct for me has been a game changer. Um, typically, manual instruments are straight. And particularly with an endoscope, it can somewhat obstruct um, you when you're going deep with the instrument because you, your hands, your left hand, so in my case, the left hand that's holding the endoscope and the right hand that's holding the correct, they're coming in close proximity because of the straight nature of the, the instrument. With loops or microscope, um, similarly, your hands, when you're going deeper in the ear, your hands almost crossing over your line of sight. So it, uh, particularly if you're removing wax on the right hand side in the deeper regions of the ear canal, if you're right handed and vice versa, if you're left, your, ha your ha holding hand can sometimes obscure your optical axis. Um, so with the angle version, um, your hand is away from both your line of sight and from your endoscopic hand, so in my case, the left hand, which gives me so much more freedom of movement with the correct. Um, so it's really, really helped in this particular patient and the patient themselves have noticed the difference in terms of comfort. Um, also with the right angle correct, uh, you would have seen it right at the beginning, the tip is tapered. So what I mean by that, the tip is a lot narrower than the base of the scoop itself, the correct. Um, and there's a curvature uh, we've um, inserted into the correct end as well. And that curvature is designed to mimic the curvature of the ear canal. And that helps when you're gliding up against the ear canal wall. There's less friction because the shape of the correct is trying to resemble the shape of the ear canal. It's particularly useful in cases like this where 
we are going really, really deep in the ear on the bony, osseous portion of the ear canal. Um, unless you've had earwax removed before yourself or uh, you're, uh, let's see, a clinical ear professional, it's hard to really understand and describe to others just how sensitive the bony part of the ear canal is, the inner two thirds. I know firsthand because I've had trauma to the bony part of my ear canal many, many years ago. And obviously treating patients um, uh, for the best part now, of being well, I started my audiology training in 2004, so 21 years. Um, you realise just how sensitive it is. And um, I'm not uh, ashamed to say that in the past, I've caused some discomfort to patients. It's one of the risks of performing ear wax removal, um, but you want to minimise that risk. So this invention of the right angle correct for me has really improved patient comfort uh, when using a correct, particularly deep in the ear. Another thing about this type of wax, as you can see, because it's so wet and soft, it's almost smearing it across the floor of the ear canal. So spoiler alert, there is going to be some wax remaining um, uh, at the end of the video, but um, it's just uh, surface coating wax. A bit of wax is, is fine for us, but uh, you don't want to be causing discomfort to the patient um, um, so you, it's okay to leave somewhere. Even at this stage, if, if, if one of my clear action, um specialists that I'm training got to this stage and they don't feel comfortable and confident, which they won't initially, of course, I would say leave it as this. This is, uh, this is fine. Um, uh, you can see the whole eardrum sound can conduct through. And this patient's a chronic sufferer of wax, so uh, they, they're going to have to come back regardless. So what's the point of trying to remove everything if you're not uh, comfortable in doing so. Um, when the patient, you might reduce, you might skim off a few weeks from the next appointments if that, but then risk patient discomfort, they're not gonna come back to you. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not gonna speak highly of you because you've caused them harm. But um, once you get more skilled and comfortable um, it's possible to safely remove this. So you can see I've inverted the correct. So the arc is uh, mimicking the floor on the front part of the ear canal. I'm, as I'm gliding, I'm kind of also coming away because I'm trying to avoid smearing it. And this technique I find helps. I always wondered why the little why there's a little hole in the middle of the correct. And this is a good example. So when you're scooping soft wax, you're kind of allowing it to enter that hole so it's not just stuck at the base of the correct, which will then just smear that wax that's at the base of the correct against the ear canal wall without removing it. So that hole allows the wax to travel up it as you're gently gliding. So this is the anterior canal wall. So again, just got that angle of the correct to mimic the front part of the ear canal. You can see with the endoscope, we're going right to left to straighten, and stretch open the ear. Lovely textbook eardrum, I must say. You can actually see the long process of the incus. So the incus is the second bone in the uh, middle ear. There's three bones, the malleus, also known as the hammer bone, the incus, also known as the anvil, and the stirrup, which is medically known as the stapes. In a translucent ear canal, um, quite often you can see part of the middle bone, the incus. Of course, the hammer bone is attached to the eardrum, so that should be visible. Well, at least the majority of it is a lot of the hammer bone that you don't see because it's hidden behind um, the eardrum and it goes upwards superiorly. So that's the neck of the malleus and the um, head of the malleus. In patients where there's an erosion um, at the top of the uh, ear canal near the eardrum, the scutum region, so that's the part of the bone. Um, so, for example, patients who are suffering from an autoatic otomy, where that part of the bone is eroded because the eardrum is sucked in and it's constricting blood vessels, it's also initiating osteo um, class, which remodel bone and break it down and into its core minerals and um, tissues and redistribute it to other parts of the body where a new bone can be formed. So that top, or if you've had a cholesteatoma, um, which basically chews away the bone and any surrounding tissue, um, 
you can then get a peak view of inside the middle ear. So this wax is just more near the entrance. And as I'm scooping, I'm going up, because the ear canal, as you enter, dips down. And just see how sticky this wax is. I'm glad to say the patient's completely comfortable throughout. And the reason why we're using Coretus is if you are suffering from tinnitus, so tinnitus is any type of sound that originates with inside your ears or your head, so it's not an external sound that you're hearing. Uh, and it's only typically heard by yourself. However, I've had cases, uh, pulsatile tinnitus, where if I uh, position my ear close to the patient's ear, I can actually hear the pulsing myself. Um, so I had a patient with a blocked carotid artery, and the blood was trying to pump through, and you can audibly hear that um, um, when you when you go up close and the patient actually recorded it on the phone they placed the phone microphone next to their ear and recorded it initially sent it to me um, and there's many causes for tinnitus um, and because there's so many causes it's really hard to find one silver bullet one uh, fit for all treatment but um, one of the triggers of tinnitus can be noise exposure. Now, it can be medication, it could be stress, diet, fatigue. Um, it could be associated with hearing loss, wax, an infection in the ear, head trauma. Uh, the list really does go on. Um, but in some patients with tinnitus, um, when you introduce noise, it can cause it to spike. Typically, it's a temporary spike, but rather be safe than sorry. So you want to avoid, wherever possible, um, microsuction and, of course, irrigation. Now, sometimes it's just not possible to um, avoid microsuction. So um, you need to explain the risk to the patient. And you want to, of course, minimise the noise exposure. There's many ways you can do that. You can use a smaller suction tip. So we've got a collection of right ear canal suction tips of varying sizes. Um, it's also the technique, how you grab onto the wax with the suction to minimise um, noise, um, ensuring you're not in the ear for too long, um, so not uh, so you have a little uh, interval, so you can just go in there for a few, uh, five to ten seconds and come away and uh, just allow a little break. But it, wherever possible, of course, you want to avoid using any suction. And I do find in the UK at least that not many specialists feel comfortable using um, manual insurance. And I suspect that's part of training. When I first got trained, I didn't really get trained on any uh, uh, manual instruments. I was given them um, to take away, um, to use, but I wasn't trained, so I didn't feel comfortable. So then I worked with my ENT colleague, um, Darius Rajali, uh, really spent a long, long time um, just working alongside him and perfecting my skills. So we, we do try and um, you know, encourage specialists at our training course to use manual insurance, and we do provide training on that, but many are quite hesitant. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.